uh, comics are stupid. No Harry Potter movie is good. Like, Give me the Snyder Cut! Oh, sorry. Just walk in front of you here. I'm gonna put my popcorn down. Oh, sorry. I'm gonna put this here. <laughs> Universal needs to sue Sony. Hey, I'm an idiot. I was fired from Fox. Let me go. <laughs> I'd like actually to see Venom just crush Spider Man. Hello, everyone. We're back today. And again, episode two of this series, uh, Hollywood in Canada. We are joined by our second guest, Nathaniel LaRouche. How are you doing? Doing great. Nice to meet you. It's exciting to be on here. I'm so excited you agreed. I was like, <laughs> you've got such a cool job too. And so you're going to get to like tell us how cool and how, yeah, your job's just so cool. And I've, I've done like a good amount of research. So it's because, you know, interview preparation. It'll be interested to seeing what you've, what you've digged up. It'll be, it'll be cool. <laughs> and so you can follow um, Nathaniel on the, on his social media, which is on the screen. Like, you can see it on your screen. He can't see it on his screen, obviously, but like, you know. And so, yeah, let's, I'm alone today because um, of obligations for my co-host, but we carry on because that's what we do. Keep pushing forward. So we are joined by a VFX artist. I believe he's had the biggest titles he's had, or, or at least from what I could find, were the VFX supervisor, CG supervisor, and visual production supervisor. I, I don't know, I don't, now, I'm going to have to ask you first, actually, before I even go beyond that, and obviously, we've got to talk about how you are a, um, a multiple-time Canadian Screen Award nominee and winner, actually, won once, for Hyena Road, I believe. Yeah, yeah, that was a cool project to, to be on. We actually went out onto a location, onto set uh, for that one, uh, out in Jordan, um, and uh, shot a bunch of elements and plates for that, but um, yeah, that was that was uh, an exciting moment for for the whole team um, going up on stage in front of everyone and accepting that award. But uh, there's been a lot of other like people that I've met along the way, super talented artists that kind of worked with me on that on that show. But uh, yeah, that, that was a that was a highlight of the career for sure. So let's talk. Let's actually dive a little bit more into that specific thing because I'm curious. How is it? So w when you get nominated, right? How what is that feeling like as you're kind of like awaiting the results? Like, is that like a calming <laughs> feeling or is it just are like, what's it like? Tell me. Uh, it's a mixture of a bunch of different feelings. I mean, you're excited because like you're in a nice looking place in a theater surrounded by a bunch of great looking people. You're all dressed up. Um, you know, usually like my partner was there along with me uh, and then the whole team. And there's definitely like energy, positive energy in the room. But then as you're sitting there and you have like you have a booklet of like the entire schedule for the night. And you see the moment like slowly creeping up of when, you know, the, you're going to find out what the results are. Uh, and you just kind of slowly get more and more nervous as it creeps up. And then there's the pause right before they announce it. And, um, and then, yeah, yeah, as soon as, as, as you hear it, you kind of just get like this wave, this rush of positive energy. And uh, I think there was like, 20 of us there that night because like with, with a vfx crew like you're working with a huge 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 team and uh yeah we all showed up that night and we all ran up onto the stage and uh the visual effects supervisor i was working with at the time phil jones uh ended up having to do the speech uh i didn't have to do that thankfully um but yeah and then they kind of go backstage they snap a couple pics um, and that's, uh, that's kind of it. I, I had the pictures somewhere. I think I ended up, uh, treating the screen award like a guitar and got a pretty funny picture out of it, but, uh, I got, I should dig that up and print it up, put it on the wall. <laughs> that, that, yeah. that, that must be like an awesome, yeah, that must be an awesome thing to like, just like, and it like the, like the winning part, obviously I, I feel like the losing part is a little bit less, um, <laughs> exciting, but you know, so quickly before we kind of 
continue. I want to just, because I think a lot of people are going to be confused when you say things like VFX supervisor and all these things. So just tell me, what does a VFX supervisor, a CG supervisor, and a visual virtual production supervisor, like what do they do? What are the differences? Are they basically all the same with different names or are they actual substantially different roles? Yeah, they're all uh, slightly different roles and responsibilities. Um, when I started out in the industry, I was very much interested in computer graphics and rendering out images on uh, whatever computer hardware that I had had and then trying to mix it with uh, photography and uh, video that I was capturing at that point in time. Uh, it would have been high eight or DV tapes um, and just like mixing those different mediums together. So when I ended up entering the workforce, I was kind of like a, a computer graphics generalist, which um, in a team, uh, if you're in charge of the computer graphics division, you would be considered a CG supervisor. So a CG supervisor's role would be supervising the creation of all of the CG elements that are needed before they end up getting composited into the final shot. Um, so in, in VFX, it's very typical to have a CG supervisor associated with a project. Um, so that was one role that I had for many years. And then um, after that, I kind of went up to being a visual effects supervisor, which is kind of overseeing um, not only like the actual shoot, so like the filming of the shots uh, that need to eventually be affected, but also following that shot all the way through from beginning to, to, to end uh, in post-production um, and working with like the director and working with the DP and just making sure that the end product is what they had kind of imagined. Um, and then I'll, I'll work with like a giant team um, on the VFX side to kind of make sure that it runs as smoothly as it possibly can. Um, and then there's virtual production, which is something that has really only been a thing in the past like five, five years. Avatar kind of did it when it originally came out like 10 years ago, but it was like done fully on, like it was all motion capture. It wasn't, like, <clears throat> there wasn't like an actual camera recording and getting final images in camera. It was mostly just like mocap. Um, so a virtual production supervisor works with um, production to kind of create these virtual worlds, similar to what Mandalorian does with like the giant LED walls. So in Toronto, we actually have one volume that we've been shooting the past two seasons of Star Trek on. Uh, and I've been supervising that. So that's kind of the main difference between a virtual production supervisor and a visual effects supervisor. <laughs> is that a virtual production supervisor like does things in camera as final and doesn't need to go into post-production. Yeah, you're hitting all the, like, the nerd things and I'm loving it so much <laughs> right now. Um, now I do have to, I have to, I'm going to get you to recall a movie, okay? You were the CG sure. supervisor for it. I believe it was, it was like, I don't. I'm not. I'm not gonna pretend I know what year it came out in. Um, it's. It was status update. I don't know if you recall this movie. Do you recall it? Oh my god, what year was that? I think it was 2017. It, it starred Olivia Holt and the guy from Austin and Alley. Would have been at uh, Intelligent Creatures at that point in time. Yes. I think. Uh, what about it? So, well, what, do you remember? So. Well, first of all, I gotta say it's one of my favorite movies, like just like guilty pleasure movies. But okay. to talk more about in terms of like a movie like that, which not necessarily, I guess, very in the traditional sense CGI focused, right? How would mm -hmm. you kind of explain to people the role that you would play in it, even though it isn't like typically like you expect like you know space and whatever to be CGI? This is not that mm -hmm. kind of movie. So what? How do you kind of explain to people that kind of your role, I guess, and what you do for something like that. 
in a film like that, that's like where you start. That's like invisible effects. So, um, sometimes there'll be like a lot of interior scenes. Um, they'll actually shoot on a soundstage because the exterior isn't really, it's not really uh, predictable, like weather patterns and things like that, and trying to keep a consistent look across the entire film. So sometimes outside the window, there would be like blue screens or set extensions there. Uh, and that's pretty typical in movies like that. Um, so it's kind of like it's doing set extension work there, um, which is mostly compositing. So we'll do uh, a shot on blue where you'll have like your set in the foreground, window, blue screen, and then you'll shoot an element of whatever daytime background or city street or something like that. And then that would eventually get uh, the blue would end up being keyed. And then the new element positioning composite behind that. Um, so there, there's that type of work, which is invisible VFX. And then uh, there's just like clean up here and there where you get the boom mic, you get like other <laughs> other things that you just, you wouldn't expect or uh, like blemish clean up here and there um or um a lot sometimes what happens is they'll like two different takes uh they'll like like the performance of a take and then another another act from another take and they'll you'll try to like blend them together uh so in a movie like that where you, you you'd watch it and you'd be like oh they're really I, I, nothing really stands out as being vfx uh it's with how easy it is to now combine different things together um there's a lot of tiny invisible effects like that that go on in pretty much every single film that's that's released nowadays. Um, yeah, it's, it's like very uncommon to have a film go through that has like no VFX in it now. Everything is pretty much being touched up. And it's VFX to some extent or the other, right? Like not all of them are yeah. big spectacles. Um, so let's talk mm -hmm. a bit more about you and how you got interested in VFX and, 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 and art and kind of also talking about your early kind of childhood when you kind of realized that this was something you wanted to do with the rest of your life? <laughs> um, kind of just randomly happened. It wasn't planned at all. The, uh, was there something like a movie you saw a little... that, or something that kind of like sparked this? Um, I had a little bit of a weird upbringing where uh, my parents were actually magicians. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, and my dad was like very interested in film and we watched film almost every single night. And, um, and then in high school, um, what did I have at that point in time? I think I bought my first computer it was like a G3, it was like a Mac, like a power Mac G3. And that was the first thing I was able to, to actually edit. I think it was iMovie. It was like iMovie. And then I had like PowerPoint to do animation in, um, but I started experimenting with doing like stop motion and then also going out and just like shooting like my buddies skateboarding around the town and stuff like that. And then uh, mixing in different filters. Anyways, I saw there was one series of animations that came out right before I had to make the choice of what I wanted to do like in college, which is by this Toronto director, uh, Chris Landris. Um, there is this really weird, um, short that he put out called Ryan. I'm trying to remember what year it was released in. Must have been like late nineties. But, um, that, I remember my mom buying me a DVD of that and it had like three short films on it. And then he, uh... He did a couple other short films after that, but those ones convinced me to go into animation. And I was like, oh, okay, this is like another way to tell stories. Uh, I don't, you know, I couldn't really afford film school. Uh, so I went into animation school. And then in animation school, there was a two week visual effects course, which kind of combined everything that I had loved, like shooting practical photography. And then mixing it with like weird CG crap. So, uh, 
So I, I just like gravitated towards that medium. And then my VFX teacher at that school offered me an internship. And that was kind of it. And then it's just been playing around in that industry ever since. Interesting. That's actually, that's actually like cool that like, it's like you didn't really take a, like you kind of just, you know, started and just, just went on from there. Like it wasn't really a lead up. It was just kind of like you decided to do it and you did it. And that's awesome. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what was your favorite movie growing up? Um, at what age? What age? <laughs> like if there's one movie that kind of sticks out in your mind as like, you know, the one you hold in high regard as like a childhood classic, what would it be? Um, I mean, in terms of animation, like Iron Giant would be... That's one of the ones that I can't wait to actually show my 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 kid once he's old enough to like actually Remember watch, it. watch. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's one of those last. It's like, I mean, Brad Bird is amazing. Or like he does. He's done tons of of great films, but that one, it's, it's there's amazing. just has so much charm to it. And it's one of the last like classically animated things that actually mixed in CG into it almost seamlessly like the robots cg but everything else is like 2d um yeah that's probably my top childhood film for sure so now we gotta ask this question for branding purposes um do you like superheroes uh i mean i like i mean i have no problem with superheroes uh movies i feel like almost every single film that comes out right now is a superhero movie <laughs> I want a little bit of variety, but yeah, I, I, I like superheroes. I mean, I like you worked them. on a number of superhero things. You worked on One Division. You worked <laughs> on Watchmen. <laughs> I, do we count Watchmen yeah, as a superhero yeah. thing? I don't know. It's like a comic book thing. It's not really. They're not really superheroes. So I mean, you can, you can, you can argue the yeah, that, but. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's hard not to work on superhero stuff nowadays. But uh, I do. Yeah, well, Watchmen was was really fun i fortunately had the opportunity to work on both Zack snyder's film and the hbo series that just came out um, which one is more fun to work and, on um i was heavily more involved in the hbo series um we did looking glasses mask but i got to design that from the ground up um which ended up being like a, I would consider a pretty much invisible effect, but it's CG almost like 90% of it is all computer generated in order to like art direct the reflections that were on the mask the entire time. Um, but I was there for every single shoot. Um, we had to mount cameras on Tim Blake Nelson's head <laughs> to capture reflections. <laughs> So I would like I would run in between every single take and mount the camera on and like press all these buttons. He didn't he didn't like it at first, but then uh, we we ended up you know getting along later on. But uh, yeah, it was uh, that was a really interesting process and an interesting problem to try to solve to get all of the right re reflections captured for it. Um, but yeah, that would probably be my favorite superhero movie that I worked on. If you want to count it as superheroes, but yeah, we've kind of gone over. Um, so now you're someone who works in VFX, and we know that the, the the internet culture loves to like pick on the tiny little things in in, in VFX. Um, so I got to ask you: Do you have any pet peeves when you watch movies, especially when it comes to like sloppy use of VFX or animation or anything like that? And is that something that sticks out to you specifically, or? Um. It's only when, like, and I'll give an example, a fairly recent example, like Batman. <laughs> um, like, the whole movie, VFX-wise, was spotless. It's like everything was amazingly integrated up all the way until, like, the end of the film where you get a moment where they just want to do something insane, like a, a water, like, pouring into... The uh, the arena that they're all in, and that shot just like 
stood out to me as just being like, well, they just wanted to spend a bunch of money on a VFX <laughs> shot, and it looked like a VFX shot. Like it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't as invisible as all of the other amazing work that had been done in that film, and also wasn't needed to tell the story. And it, and it, and it actually pulled me out for a moment from the whole, like this amazing ride that I had been on the entire time. So, um, I really like visual effects when it's used properly, but, uh, when it's just like a flashy shot that doesn't help push the story at all, it's kind of, I don't know, it just, it irks me a little bit, especially when it's not done to like... Dead well. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I'm going to kind of dig into this a little bit more. So mm-hmm. what would, so if you, let's say you could go back and you could fix this movie, okay? The, you could fix the Batman. What would you do for that shot instead? Um, I don't think you need it. Like water is still very difficult to do realistically. You didn't need it at that point. You could have just had the um, you could have just had the stadium slowly, just the water in it just go up. Like you didn't need this giant rushing. So you would have kept the wall, water, water the water state it. thing, but you would have just done it so it comes up instead of rushes in and yeah okay yeah yeah which is i don't know i think that's a bit more elegant it's a bit more a bit cleaner uh and doesn't wouldn't wouldn't stand out all, all that much or you do like an exterior shot uh, something else that's not as close up or brightly lit um of like water rushing over something else but yeah so you mentioned something there, which I want to kind of talk about a little bit more, or ask you a little bit more about, which is <laughs> you said the words, and it stuck out, it was brightly lit. So now, typically in movies, when, you know, they, 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 their times will intentionally go darker and, you know, either make it nighttime or whatever. The one that sticks in my mind the most is like the, the third act of Spider-Man Homecoming where they're do, they have the plane scene and it's all at night. What is that? A, is that an intentional technique and why is it used if it is of going dark with the scene going dark with typically cgi heavy scenes oh well i mean you get away with a lot going darker it's that's uh that's kind of the easy way out um it's also less render times like and there's also a lot of re- like who knows what they had like schedule wise to actually get it done. I've been in situations where you only have like a couple weeks to pull off something that you f- really feel like would take months and months and months of work, and they're like, "Well, you only got two weeks, so <laughs> live with it." And they're like, well, "But but it's a huge film." They're like, "Yeah, but we have to get it out for for this date." Um. So you have to cut corners a lot left, right, and center to get things out. <laughs> and one of those things could be uh, to light it very dark and to hide uh, a lot of things and try to focus your the viewer's attention in the frame to like just like one one spot. So if you light it with you know one area that you know they're going to be looking, and you just put all your your effort there, and everything else ends up becoming really dark. Um, that could be it, or it could also. I've also had um, situations where that's what the DP wanted. And we can't, we don't, we can't really can't argue with them. Like that's just their vision, and they want to go dark with that moment, so we have to. Um, and then there's other situations where uh, we've done all this amazing work, and then it gets into DI or like coloring stage, which we don't have any control over, and the colorist just crushes the whole <laughs> all of the work and removes everything that that uh that we've added so um yeah it, there, there's a could be a lot of reasons to that for that but not being part of that example that you just brought yeah. up i don't know i wouldn't be able to but that's those could be the the reasons so now i gotta ask now i gotta ask you this which is what is the biggest thing you've kind of left in anything you've worked on you've kind of left unfinished or left with you know 
errors or the biggest error that you have because i know you know all, i'm sure you know in your head all of the, all of the like the little <laughs> things that you left and um hmm trying to think what left undone or something when you're watching the final kind of cut you were like hey that's not right <laughs> shouldn't have yeah yeah um and there's a lot <laughs> there's a lot um there was this one documentary that we worked on Battlefield Cell, it was like, I think it was early 2000s. But there were, there were some assets in that um, that weren't even textured, I don't even <laughs> think. I think we just like, it's essentially texturing is like giving like a virtual object for, for people who don't know, like the actual a virtual object that you're creating in CG, giving it like actual color and like surface the properties to make it look like it. Uh, it's not just a gray thing, uh, which it would be by default if you don't texture it. Um, so there were definitely a few scenes in that, uh, just due to it being a documentary and the budget not being like insanely high to be able to texture everything to the final degree that you'd want to. Um, but yeah, that we ended up coming up with like a compositing cheats just to kind of give the illusion that it was textured. Um, but looking back at that, like it still works, kind of works, you know. Um, there's definite things that, because in film, you really only need to protect for, like what the camera sees. Uh, there's definite assets or like props that we've built that I know like only work <laughs> for, from that shots. Man, like as soon if you were to look at all like from the side. Or from the back, there would just be nothing there, or it would just be like half broken, or the textures would be, you know, all uh, all stretched out. Um, Do you have an so, example of that? Yeah. Off the top of your head. Um. There's um. A, usually, um, you end up doing cheats like that on environment work. Like on city shots, um, so for what it was it battle no battle L A, there were some city streets that we had done, and there's like this projection technique where you take a photograph of buildings, um, and you kind of project them on it as if you would like projection mapping a projector onto like a building, like a real building. But you do it in CG, and so you take a picture and you project it onto like a low-resolution model of the building that kind of represents its form, and then you're able to actually move around it because it, you're projecting a 2D image onto a 3D piece of geometry, and then you can move a camera by it. So that, that's like how we would do a lot of cities um, in like the early 2000s, um, and uh, yeah, like the, in Battle LA, there's a lot of buildings where if if you were to fly around the other side, like it would just be a complete mess. It would just totally fall, fall apart. Um, <laughs> so that would be one example there. But it only has to look good through through the lens. It's true. The only people what people see is all they know. Um, oh yeah. So it's the same thing with practical sets too. <laughs> <laughs> like real sets, you look at it from the side. It's just like it's a mess. It's yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, what was your favorite project to work on? All-time favorite. Um what we're doing right now, I'd actually probably say is my uh like the stuff in virtual production for um Star Trek has been very rewarding. Um it's the first time that I've like worked directly with a production crew, like with the production designer, the DPs, uh, writers, um, all of like the major creative heads of, of a show. 
Um, whereas, like, before that, in visual effects, it's kind of just, like, handed to you. And you're just like, okay, I guess I have to deal with all these problems. <coughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, now I'm, act- like, s- sitting in meetings and fleshing out the creative for environments and being able to pitch ideas back to them and actually see them being shot um, and affecting the show uh, is pretty special. And I just haven't really experienced that before. So um, pretty excited to see what uh, the future brings to that type of tech and future projects. But yeah, right now I'm kind of... Uh, enjoying this new uh, frontier of, of virtual production. And it's just VFX was kind of getting, like I've been doing it for almost 15 years and it was kind of starting to get a bit repetitive. Um, but yeah, VP has just added some spice into the the, uh, the food. So yeah, it, it's fun. It's fun again. It's good. That's amazing. So um, if if you could choose kind of one project because I, I, I at least from what i'm aware of and you can tell me if i'm wrong here actually uh, are you you're just doing star, star trek right now for the most part right uh yeah right now mainly uh strange new worlds yep so if you could choose one kind of type of project to kind of work on what would it be and why like a like a not like an actual story, like a certain genre or what what, what type of project? Like a, like a genre, like a, yeah, like a genre, like a general, I'm not going to come up with a complete story, but like, you know, kind of a general genre for a project you'd want to work on. What would it be? Um, I, mean, I love sci-fi. Uh, I love horror. Um, it would be cool to do like a space opera type thing. Um, but as a virtual production supervisor, I'd like to do a project that has like a lot of interesting optical illusions in it, whether or not it's like different worlds, like going into different portals or different ways of bending reality, like reality. Because I think you could, we can get some pretty interesting things in camera, like practically using that type of technology. Whereas right now we're just sort of extending sets. We're not. We're not. I don't know. We we haven't really. It, like the the tech is so young. Um, we haven't really figured out all of the interesting things that we can do with it yet. Um, so there's that. And then in terms of like my own stuff, I just. I, um, a lot of like the music videos and the short films that I'm releasing, uh, they don't have any people in them. (laughs) Uh, I want to start working with live action, uh, and people more, um, and just starting to craft more complex stories. Um, and, uh, and there's one project that I'll be, I think I'm, it's being released this month, actually. I think it's the 20th. Um, but um, it's um, it's sort of like Fantasia meets this sci-fi uh, abandoned world where all of these um, mechanical processes are still going on after human beings have left. Um so that's something that I'm kind of interested in growing further to kind of create these kind of cool experimental um, animated pieces. Um, and there's all this new um, things happening with NFTs and being able to fund projects and distribute them through these brand new means that I think is going to give the opportunity for people to experiment with things that would never ever get greenlit like you'd never get funding for weird experimental indie films but 
um, I think now we could start um, gathering more resources to pay to have these weird <laughs> things. And I think over the next couple of years, there's going to be some cool uh, new approaches on how to fund uh, shorts. Um, and as people's attention spans shrink more and more and more, I think short films are going to start blowing up. Like even like Love, Death, Robots, like that, that series is so much fun to watch. Uh, and I just want to see more more content like that. So basically a bunch of TikTok films is the future. That's what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So now there's probably a lot of people, or at least some amount of people watching this who are kind of like saying, this seems cool. I want to do this with my life. So what kind of advice do you have to Canadians who kind of want to do stuff with VFX and animation? Um, I mean, the, the internet's... A- big place <laughs> there's um pretty much anything you can learn in school you can learn online for free and uh you have some pretty amazing open source communities right now developing software like blender that's free that can do just as much as any of the really expensive software that we use in bfx houses uh can do like it's 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 up there and it's actually we're gonna probably start using it more often um in in feature films and in tv series um and then you also have like unreal engine which uh more and more um it's being adopted into all types of different industries now and it's going to be used like everywhere um so um, if you're self-driven and you don't need to go and spend the whole boatload of money at in university or college, uh, I definitely recommend it because that degree is not <laughs> it's not needed in this industry. Um, as long as you you know just keep pushing yourself and keep learning the new evolving tech because it like it changes every single month. Um, and then you apply what you learn to a personal project. Um, I think if, if you keep doing that and people see it and people like it, uh, you'll naturally fall into the industry. Um, yeah, you're not in the, the industry isn't going to pull you into it. You just, you need to kind of jump into the hole show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You jump into the, the river to swim type of deal. Well, thank you. So I'm not going to keep you much longer. Uh, thank you so much for your time. This is great. I'm so happy that you agreed <laughs> to come. And I highly recommend everyone follows Nathaniel on social media. It's on the screen again. Um, so yeah, you're on you're on Twitter and Instagram and all that stuff, right? Oh yeah, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, and uh, also have just like the website too. Yes, just NathanielRouge.com, and you can just hit me up there. Yeah, so every, and if, if, everyone, if anyone, you know, listening to this wants pointers or anything, I'm sure you'll be happy to answer questions too. So, you know, there's... Totally. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for coming on. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate you coming on and taking your time. I know this kind of got moved around a bit, but... <laughs> All good. Um, All good. But yeah, thank you so yeah. much. And everyone who's watching, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, all that stuff, you know. And we'll be back with another episode next Monday because they're watching this on Monday. So yeah, thank you and see you all.